But as I pointed out from the stethoscope uh, founded by the Frenchman Lanec uh, from Brittany and the most important diagnostic tool and now uh, it goes up to the different imaging techniques. Yeah, radiation exposure in children, it's an important aspect, a very important uh, point uh, because the sensibility of children is higher compared to adults towards radiation exposure. It shows you a very good the graph here on the right side. Uh, at the lower bar, you see the age at the CT examination. Yeah, Keep in mind, CT has a higher dosage than conventional radiography. Nevertheless, um, it's the same source of irradiation, it, which is used. And you see here, births 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, and so on. And then my age for the gray, gray haired man and the women, then it's not a problem. But when you go back to birth, birth time, then you see the estimated attributable risk to develop cancer, to have cancer in later stages. It's, it's elevated, that's clear. And reasons are manifold. Uh, first of all, the numbers of cell which are in separations is higher compared to adults. We have pluripotential bone marrow, red bone marrow in different uh, bone aspects, yeah, not all all bones. only in the vertebral column, but also in the pelvic bones, in the lung bones. Um, then the size, that means if you take a, a chest X-ray, then radiosensitive organs like gonads or, or um, thyroid gland or other things are quite closer to the area which is or has to be irradiated, the lungs. Uh, life expectancy clear is longer than in adults and therefore the risk for late manifestations, manifestations of irradiation is higher. And there are possibilities to quantify the damage by radiation exposure. These are merely data from CT examinations in adults. We have no uh, uh, large data for, for children. And the examinations were performed uh, prior and after CT examinations, um, lymphocytes by blood draws were uh, examinated for so-called FOTSI inside. And the FOTSI are might uh, show you a possible damage inside this cells. And uh, you see here by fluoroscopy analysis, uh, the results from irradiation inside this lymphocytes. And if you look on the bar on the right side, the graph on the right side, you see when you add contrast agent, iodinated yod contrast agents, then these effects on lymphocytes on cells are increased. After some hours, you don't see any effects, but nobody knows what's happened. Are these cells which go on, which are manipulated, or dif differentiated otherwise later on? Nobody knows exactly, but there is without any question, the attributable cancer risk for, of irradiation, especially for CT imaging. The higher the dose, the higher the risk. Uh, for conventional radiography, uh, nevertheless, uh, there are a lot of pros for this examination because it's fast. You can use it bedside in the ICU. It has a rather low dosage and there are at least are no reports which show that the dosage which is lost used for conventional radiography really induces cancer later on. And uh, we have some improvements in last years. It's, I will show you later on on some slides. We have now digital examination techniques which lowered the dosage which has to be used about uh, tenfold lower. Uh, but there are some Cons, it's only an overview. You see everything on the image, yes, uh, but you don't see any functional aspects. Uh, you have to use ionizing irradiation um, and uh, the resolution, but also a side effect of the digital radiography went up. And that's quite good. Uh, you see here, for example, this was a young girl, uh, 12 year old with cystic fibrosis. This was the old technique. This is the new technique with digital images. You see far more uh, lines. And when we switched to the digital area, then first we thought, oh, 
if there are uh, something increase of disease in this girl, or is it the better technique that we see more lines inside lung parenchyma in cystic fibrosis? No, it was the technique. And for certain magnification and for the central parts of the right left hilum, and you see lymph nodes, you see a better delineation also of the process and of structures inside lung parenchyma. What's the most important aspect? And this is important for the technicians who take the images, the chest x-rays is be as close as possible to the site you want to analyze. It is that uh, uh, you use shuttering uh, and uh, you uh, have to decrease the field size as low as possible. This is a, a side aspect of the so-called ALARA principle, as low as reasonable achievable. It's clear if the child is agitated or is in the ICU, then uh, you have to uh, administer a very good image that you can interpret it, but also the other side be uh, as close as possible to the organ you want to analyze it is in this case for the lung. And that's one factor which, which really decreases significantly the dose that you have to use when you have a very close window, I call it window, uh, for the chest. That brings me to the first uh, multiple choice question, uh, concentrating on conventional chest radiography, which of the following are important items for radiation safety and protection. The younger the child, the more sensitive it is towards radiation. Ionizing radiation leads um, to cell damage, which can be quantified. Think about the FOTC and the lymphocytes. Digital plane radiography reduces radiation dose. Alara, it is as low as reasonable achievable field site is a major factor to reduce radiation. Which choice, choice best characterizes the correct answer? One and two are correct, all are correct, one, two, three are correct, three and four are correct. Please vote. Yeah, that's a very good result. Yes, indeed, all are correct. Uh, more than three quarters of participants have uh, took the, the right uh, answer because uh, as I pointed out, yes, um, I see for number four, the field side as low as possible achievable is also a major factor to reduce radiation dose, I, I showed you the image of the young child. And if you uh, close or uh, at, uh, adjust the window to the organs you want to analyze, here is the lung parenchyma, then the extra dosage is reduced. For example, your scattering is reduced to the eyes, to the thyroid gland, to gonads, to abdomen, to, to extremity and what else. Therefore, all questions are correct. Very good, excellent. That brings me to the next part, ultrasound. Ultrasound um, has a lot of pros. It's also fast. Um, it can be used bad side. You have no irradiation. I think that's a very important aspect. And you have a lot of additional information. It's not only B-mode like brightness, grayscale, ultrasound, but you can use CDI color-coded you know, duplex ultrasound. You can use, I will show you an example, M like motion for diaphragmic motion analysis, but there are some cons. It's the restricted overview. Nevertheless, you can use, for example, a panoramic view. It's not like a handy available, but also you can use it for ultrasound and you can really uh, analyze and show in one picture an area of 40 centimeters, for example, this US scanner, that's possible, it's very good to, to present an overview. 
we have a problem with deep structures, maybe also by reflection, by air inside lung parenchyma, then it's not possible to look into the body. Um, we document only some uh, examples of images. We don't use a video which shows the whole examinations and uh, the analysis of the images is more or less performed inside our brains, the brains of the examiner. That's maybe the main drawback of that. Nevertheless, this shows you on the right on the side, it was a boy with pneumonia and an abscess. You see here, this is the line of the diaphragm. Below that, uh, this is liver parenchyma. This gives you an idea about here the thorax. You see here some effusions. These are the hyperechogenic uh, areas here around uh, the opacificated lung parenchyma. This is the abscess. On the left side, you see a pleural effusion. Uh, and a collapse of lung parenchyma. This is collapsed lung parenchyma surrounded by pleural effusion. Gives an excellent overview without any irradiation. I think ultrasound is a shortcut to rule out a lot. We have a lot of indications. One well known is, uh, an, for example, enlargement of time is inside the mediastine. You see here this, this 11 months old boy. Uh, a chest x-ray was performed to rule out pneumonia. Then we saw this mediastinal mass. Yes, more or less it's clear, might be thymus, uh, but to be 100% sure, we performed the ultrasound. You see here on the right side, typical, a little bit like salt and pepper uh, texture of uh, here the thymus. This is the trachea, this is the esophagus. Uh, wonderfully depicted, then it's clear this is not a tumor, a malign tumor, it's normal thymus. Another example, uh, this was uh, ampiema and lymph node enlargement in the two-year-old boy. He was in our hospital since one week, history of calving, rhinitis fever, lycocytosis, uh, and you see here the opacification, almost complete opacification on the left side, on the chest x-ray, and maybe there might be the pleural effusion. It was not quite clear what, what's going on there. Okay, this might be uh, the heart, the shadow of the heart. Then we performed here ultrasound, uh, left lower lobe, you see here by the pictogram. It's clear, you see here uh, in centrally the lymph node enlargement here, the, the red areas mark that area. And you see here, um, the consolidated lung parenchyma and the ampiema also here on the left lower side of the thorax. You can use it in the intensive care unit. It's not only for diagnostic, but also for therapeutic reasons, e.g. punctures, for example. Uh, you can use it to monitor ventilator-associated pneumonia, for example, a very interesting paper, two years old. Um, and this is the clinical scenario, and this is the possibility how to quantify changes in ultrasound in the infants. And that's very important that if you have a possibility to, to have an objective quantitative parameter, then it's very good to have one idea uh, for baseline and also for follow-up and to compare the different levels of ultrasound examinations. I said that even motion analysis, we know that from echocardiography, uh, it's used without uh, any limitations, but you can use it, for example, also to analyze diaphragmic movement. This was an infant with respiratory problems. On the left side, the chest X-ray, you see a central venous line, a nasogastric uh, tube, ECG, uh, lines and you see there had been uh, some operations, cardiac surgery, and the question was as the right diaphragm clearly is quite higher in its position than the left side. Yeah, is there a movement or is there no movement? And then um, first I analyzed the left side. It's a little bit more difficult to analyze the left side of the diaphragm, but uh, the liver parenchyma was quite large in this infant, then it was possible this, uh, to use the liver parenchyma as a, 
kind of window. And this is the, the hyperechogenic line of the left diaphragm side. And you see here the movement going up and going down. And then I used the right liver lobe uh, as a window to go down to the hyperechogenic line of the right diaphragm. And you see some movement, however, it's decreased, it's significantly decreased to the left side. Clear cut, no complete phrenoparesis, but decreased movement. Yeah, a clear message. And uh, then it's possible to know, okay, the nerve is there, but uh, maybe by this infection you see on the, on the chest X-ray, we have maybe some uh, problems of the neural uh, excitation of the diaphragm movement might be better or going better when the problem of the infection is solved. Brings me to the second multiple choice question, now concentrating on ultrasound. Indications for lung ultrasound encompass respiratory distress syndrome. If you look into the literature, yes, there are some papers who tell you, yes, it's possible, but be careful when you make your choice. Think about the resolution, think about what might happen in low levels of RDS, if that really detectable by ultrasound, yes or no. Please reflect about that. You can use it for follow-up of pneumonia. Maybe I showed you an example, think about that. You can use it as guidance for pleural punctures, for example, at the ICU. You can use it for um, detection, determination of diaphragm movement. Which choice best characterizes the contract answers? Please make your choice. One and two are correct, all are correct, two, three, and four are correct, or three and four are correct. Now it's yours. Yeah, very good. I would say you can make a choice of both possibilities. I, I am in favor of um, number C, two, three, and four are correct. And the majority uh, took this choice. Uh, as I pointed out, there are some papers and even some institutions. If you have a lot of experience and a lot of, I would say cross-reference when you start your training to use ultrasound for RDS at the ICU, if you have lots of cross-reference and you are quite sure and you have a, a specialized team, then it's possible to use ultrasound even for RDS classification. However, if you don't have a lot of experience, if you don't have uh, any cross-reference, then be careful. Therefore, a very good uh, result. Um, congratulations. Yeah, I have to go back only one slide uh, concentrating on fluoroscopy. Uh, I would say, to say it in one sentence, if you do it, do it with caution. You can get functional information. For example, we have some seldom cases we use it for uh, foreign body uh, aspiration, if you should be sure if there are a hyperinflation in some part, then you can use it. Uh, if you have a very good machine with last image hold, maybe the dosage of fluoroscopy is even lower than conventional chest radiography. That's possible. If you have an old machine, if you have no filtering, if you don't have a video modus, if you have to use a magnification, then really be careful because the dosage might be quite high. Uh, then it's really a higher radiation exposure. But in, uh, in special settings, a very good machine, a trained team. It might be even an alternative in special circumstances, foreign body, for example, um, as an alternative to chest X-ray imaging. It might be the dosage lower if you have a video compared if you to take two uh, chest X-rays, one in inspiration, one in expiration, as some institutions do it. I switch over to CT. VT has uh, as pro the unsurpassed morphology. morphology. Uh, detection, we have the highest resolution in these techniques, uh, which is possible currently for any imaging technique. 
However, uh, I see a question. Uh, what are FOF's field of view? That's the area uh, I have to take. For example, this is my field of view here for the chest X-ray, if I would say, well, for the CT here, if I would say I could also select uh, a smaller field of view only for the right lung. Then if it's possible for the machine, it's nonsense, you know, we want to know it in, uh, to see the right side and left side, but you could do it, a field of view only for the right side, then the dosage is half of the full field of view. That's clear, field of view, fourth. Cons, um, um, the irradiation is higher compared to chest X-ray, to conventional radiography. Um, the first point is use low dose. That are the, the new imaging techniques with the new scanners. It's possible. Use low dose imaging techniques and use non-contrast techniques whenever possible. Non-contrast means you are only interested in detection of for example, like here, small nodules in lung parenchyma, you are not interested, for example, is there anything wrong in soft tissue? Is there a problem inside the vessels, inside the heart? Are there lymph nodes or what else? Then it's possible to lower the dosage uh, nearly to the dosage you use for uh, conventional radiography uh, with the new scanners. Um, and then it's really a good alternative if you need a high resolution, if you, for example, have to monitor a small nodule, you don't could detect by conventional radiography. It's clear that it's two, three millimeters. You won't see it on conventional chest radiography. This is an uh, example of a young girl. In our institution, we use a shielding for the mame, that's very important. Also a shielding for the thyroid gland. And then uh, because these are the most radiosensitive organs and the, all the scanners since 10 years, that's not the older ones don't have these techniques. They ha you have lower dosage in the frontal parts. It's clear due to the shielding, but the scanner uses the information which comes from the back of the body and your images are as good in the back part as in the front part. Yeah, there is no uh, disadvantage of the shielding anymore. And it's very important for the technicians and your radiologists and pediatric radiologists. They are eager to use this protection material. They also should use dose modulation and should optimize. And uh, there are special child settings in all the manufacturers have these child settings and they should uh, apply a new technique which, uh, called iterative reconstruction. It uses a little bit of artificial intelligence and uh, scattering and noise is removed from the images and then you can lower the dosage even more. The images first the primary images are more noisy, but then you have these algorithms and the noise is removed from the images. Uh, and then you have all the information, even in this reduced dose settings, very important technique. This shows you a little bit more about dose modulation because the body is typically not round, completely round. We have parts like the neck where the diameter, the CT, those have to go through the body uh, is not so large like here in the mid, midst of the chest. And therefore you, you need here at this part, a lower dosage than here in this part of the body. And the modern scanners monitor in the set, so-called set axis, the axis from the cranium to the caudium, uh, uh, the, the shape of the body. We have even now 3D cameras in the new scanners and then uh, the dose is adapted to the body surface, and that's very important in the body diameter. You can spare a lot of dosage shows in this example of the 15-year-old boy. This, this is a parameter, the dose length product, the so-called dose length product, and it goes down here in this boy when we used this technique for the first time 10 years ago. It was uh, came to the clinics and uh, typically is now integrated in all the modern scanners. Iterative reconstruction, 
uh, detection of lesions is, is unchanged, it's even better using this iterative reconstruction, this kind of nose reduction, and therefore also dose reduction, you see it here, it's almost half of the dosages is necessary, and we have now dosages, think about when I go back to the, to the slide 10 years ago, the dose length product, it's just a number, but if you compare the numbers, 110, then 10 years ago, the first step, um, it was lowered around 70. And now if you look here, a chastity nine, that means from 110, 10 years ago, it's below 10. It's, it's really a huge amendment, but not every institution has this technique where it's very necessary that you make some you push your radiologists and also all your institutions, your administrations, if you buy a new scanner, iterative reconstruction for the sake of the, in, of the children has to be implemented. Yeah. This is an example. Once again, you see here the shielding, some artifacts, but it's okay, completely okay for the new technique. In some also, once again, very special cases, we use CT even to get some functional information. The dose is a bit higher because, for example, here we had a 10-year-old boy, non-controlled asthma, missing compliance. He was not interested in therapy. Um, he had a history of dyspnea, obstruction. We took this chest X-ray, okay, hyperinflation, low diaphragms. You see some opacification. Uh, highly enlargement on both sides. And then we took uh, CT in inspiration as normally uh, in prone position, also very important, not in supine, but in prone position. And then we repeated the CT in expiration. And then you see here the hyperinflated areas in the lower uh, central areas, but also in the apical parts um, here of the lung but the price is the double dose. But uh, once here, I think about 110, 10 years ago, below 10 for small infants. Now, as you saw in the last example, it was about 60 here for a double fold CT examination. But it was very important for our pulmonologists because now they knew how, where are the areas really here about this parts, apical parts, lower parts. Also here you see this small, uh, opacification and active inflammation in these areas here, it was clear what has to be done and to uh, can use the CT as a monitoring. You have a regional functional information, a pseudo functional information, I have to admit, but it's possible. Nevertheless, sometimes we have to use a non low dose CT um, as we want to know about vessels, about lymph node enlargements, about tumors, for example. Uh, this is an example. It was a 14-year-old boy. Uh, he came for, from, it was an orphan. Uh, he came to us on a Friday afternoon with coughing, a uh, history of 14 days. Uh, we took this chest X-ray. Maybe you see something is going wrong on the left upper lobe here, a little bit round. Uh, and maybe there are some enlargements of lymph nodes. Is this a tumor? We were, on, we were not sure what, what's going on in this boy. A little bit, we had an idea about tuberculosis, but uh, uh, you can't isolate uh, a young man uh, without having a definite diagnosis. It was Friday afternoon. We performed a CT uh, with contrast, a full dose CT with contrast agent administration. And you see here, uh, and large lymph nodes here. Uh, you see here the caverna on, on the left upper lobe. You see here uh, it goes down to the bronchial tree. Uh, it's an open tuberculosis, an active open tuberculosis here, surrounded by active contrast agent uh, uptake. Uh, you see on the 3D reconstruction the virtual bronchoscopy that really is connected to the, the tracheobronchial tree. Yeah, it was clear the boy has to be isolated its TBC uh, therapy was started uh, and then uh, this was a very important step, a final, final diagnosis in, I would say in two seconds, in two seconds you need for 
uh, a modern CT scan is to have all the information, 3D information of a chest. And you can even, um, you can do also a high resolution CT without contrast agent, that's clear, but, but that's absolutely, uh, we use it for example for adults for uh, um, infiltration for idiopathic uh, pneumonia in adults, then we use a full dose CT uh, with normal dose, but never in children. At least at my institution, it's all, always low dose, I would say 99% low dose, no contrast agent. And in 1%, like this young man with the TB, we use normal dose and contrast agent. But you can even go further, at least, uh, um, in this paper from Korea, South Korea, you can do a 4D technique. This is a CT in free breathing. You see the, this collapse of the trachea, for example. Uh, nevertheless, the dosage is quite higher because you don't scan in two seconds a thorax, but you, you scan it for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, what else? It's clear it's a high dose, but if it has a ther therapeutic consequence, maybe one can use this technique. We don't use it. We could do it with our modern scanners, but we don't use, we say this is a, for example, you, you make a tracheal bronchoscopy and then it's also clear you don't have to, to use radiology for that anymore. Not everything was it's possible should be done. Brings me to the multiple choice question three for CT. Um, Pediatric CT should encompass contrast agent application mandatory, mm. dose modulation, shielding, iterative reconstruction. What do you think? What, which is the best choice? A, one and two are correct. B, all are correct. Three, one, two, and three are correct. D, two, three, and four are correct. Please make your choice. Yeah, that's good uh, because, um, as I pointed out, contrast agent application. Maybe I have to to uh, make this point clearer. Um, if you give contrast agent, you're denied it contrast agent. Then you have to increase the dosage. Otherwise, you would miss the effect of contrast agents. This belongs to special physical aspects like. KV settings and other things. I, I can't uh, explain that in detail, but uh, if you give contrast agents, you have to increase the dosage. And that's uh, the reason why whenever possible, and I pointed out in 99%, I think it's possible, we skip contrast agent application. Yeah? And there was great, almost 90% uh, took the right choice, yes, Dose modulation, the body is not round normally, is an important step. It was a first step 10 years ago. Shielding is very important. Yeah, you have to, to uh, yeah, sensitize your uh, technicians to, to do that because it's time consuming to uh, use the shielding. You have to interact with the child. Um, don't uh, fear that young girl, young boy, it's good for you. It takes some time, but if you do it properly, it really decreases the irradiation and it protects important organs like mame, like tarry gland, like organs. And iterative reconstruction, you see this amazing dosage below 10, the dose length product, uh, very important step. Thank you very much, very good. That brings me to the next. MRI. There are a lot of pros. Uh, there is no irradiation. It's like ultrasound. You have cross-sectional uh, aspects like CT. You have functional information, but without the drawback of additional doubling irradiation. 
Um, there are cons like measurement time and I think the most important is the, the availability, where is it, and the costs. Yeah, and also maybe the compliance of the children lying in, in the tube for some time. Uh, yeah, I was point out this is like an aircraft and airspace and now you're going to the moon and then you can make it comfortable and we have now very fast sequences. I will show you later on in some slices that uh, we have even uh, infants, newborns uh, for lung MRI with sequences which last not longer than 10 seconds. Yeah. Never possible 10 or five years ago, but now it's possible. Um, there are a lot of papers which are quite in favor, but normally it's too costly, too time consuming, and it's underused, I would say. MRI is underused for lung imaging in children. Um, because we have, as I said, these fast MRI lung protocols, um, we use it, for example, for planning of bronchoscopy and pneumonia. You have a 3D information in this five-year-old girl, for example. You see here the atelectasis and the inf uh, maybe inflammation, central inflammation on the right side and the, the atelectasis and the dorsal parts. And uh, our pituitary pulmonologist says to me, yeah, that's really helpful to have this 3D information prior to bronchoscopy in some special cases. It's only for one, two percent of all children who go to bronchoscopy. I have to, to, to be honest, yeah, but in this one, two, three percent, it's really helpful. Um, in comparison to CT, clearly the information about lung parenchyma is not as good as CT. That's clear. The large things like here you see, that's not a problem, um, but the small things until now at least we missed by MRI. But there are new techniques uh, which improved uh, detection of morphology for MRI. Um, techniques we use now for everyday scanning, for example, for whole body MRI in the oncologic setting. Normally we mixed whole body MRI, for example, follow up of neuroplastoma, primary diagnosis of neuroplastoma, but now we perform a whole body MRI plus a CT. And for the follow-up, we really stick now to the MRI. We skipped the CT part uh, as the information and the detection, for example, for lung nodules is so good now for MRI that we can really skip the CT, the ad additive CT part in this follow-up uh, oncologic setting. I think that's really a step in the right direction. You see here, you see not only here the vessels very well, you see here this the old technique. You don't see the vessels clearly to have a problem with lung parenchyma. You have a lot of artifacts, but with this online artifact motion correction, you see the vessels like the aortic arch, like the vena cava superior, even the vena acicos. You see the lung parenchyma. You see even small nodules like here. Yeah, it's now I think three, four years. Uh, this technique, this motion correction is available in the new scanner generation. Um, and I think it's a very good idea to use this. And this shows you in comparison, it's CT-like. It's not like CT you see here. Uh, this was uh, uh, a fungal infection in the left lower lobe here. You see here on the left side, the CT image. You see here the MRI. Yeah, you see it. You could miss it. I have to admit you have to go through all 3D data sets in at least two directions, not only in the coronal view, but also in the actual view. We have a resolution of one millimeter for MRI. It's one millimeter, not five millimeter like in earlier time. We have one, one millimeter in CT and one millimeter in MRI. And you see these changes. I think that was not foreseeable in two years ago. And what's possible since 20 years, I would say, but nobody, almost nobody use it. You can even look for, for perfusion, ventilation, uh, using oxygen um, enhanced MRI to get an idea about, uh, yeah, it's not uh, ventilation, it's not the exchange of oxygen, but you see how much of blood solve oxygen is inside the lungs. It's a pseudo ventilation, I have to admit, but you can use it 
by MRI. This gives an example. It was a um, young adult, a 24-year-old woman with cystic fibrosis. Uh, this is uh, perfusion. In MRI, you see the hyperperfusion in the right lower lobe. You see a, a decreased perfusion in the upper lobes. Uh, to Roy's, Roy's region of interest analysis. This is a uh, gadolinium perfusion image prior to contrast enhancement. This is after contrast enhancement. You see here the uptake. This is a so-called T1 map. This is a parameter in MRI, you, which gives you a functional information, ventilation information at 20%. Oxygen is room air, and this is 100% oxygen, it's by the mask. And one, once again, this same Royce region of interest, you see a change here in the one part here. This a surrogate, there is ventilation and also contrast uptake. In the areas where there is the perfusion decreased, no idea, no information about ventilation, oxygen exchange in MRI. Yeah, very interesting regional functional analysis um, per se is possible using MRI. However, it's very complicated, takes time, and maybe it needs really some years when it comes maybe to the clinics. Brings me to the last question. Lung MRI allows detection and follow-up of pneumonia reflect the case maybe of the five-year-old girl. It allows functional information, reflect about oxygen administration, room air versus uh, oxygen by the mask. It's almost the same for number three. Artifact reduction by inline motion correction is possible. Uh, and then for you, which choice best characterizes the correct answer? One and two are correct, all are correct. One, two, three are correct, three and four are correct. Please make your choice. Yeah, very good. Um, almost two thirds of the audience has taken the correct answer. We can use it for detection follow-up of pneumonia. The case of the young girl showed that we can use it for functional information. Um, we can, you, and it's based typically on oxygen uptake and this artifact reduction. Think about, of, about the example I showed you by the motion correction where not only the vessels were clearly depicted, but also the lung parenchyma and lung vessels could be detected compared to the old technique. It's a very good improvement we had in the last years. The time is almost run for me, but uh, I will go uh, to the last part to my, my talk. It's interpretation, uh, automatization by artificial intelligence. This is an example that with deep convolutional neural networks, or oh, very complicated uh, abbreviation, a differentiation now since two years of specific diseases, pneumonia and other differential diagnoses are, are possible using this enhance. Um, and now these are even integrated. This is the next step we have now, for example, in your mobile, uh, and uh, you take a photo of the chest X-ray of the CT or what else, and then you get a first interpretation of the image by algorithms, and then you can check whether this is correct or not. And this was an example for 14 diseases and differentiation apps for smartphones and a lot of images and the reading time for radiologists or pediatricians was quite long. It's clear for 420 minutes, the computer took one 0.5 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but it's limited to uh, certain diseases. And if you use an, al uh, an algorithm, it don't tell you whether, for example, your central venous line is incorrect or whether there's free air in the abdomen parts of the chest x-ray because it's trained only for distinct questions. 
And that's the problem. You have to be careful for other things. In conclusion, I hopefully I, I met your expectations concerning the aims of the presentation. Um, first, I started with the increased sensitivity um, towards ionizing irradiation in children. I think very important, has a lot of reasons, biological reasons, other reasons like compliance and other things. And then I started with the overview, um, focusing on advantages and disadvantages. Um, especially I showed you about uh, some ideas about dose and dose reduction in conventional radiography, fluoroscopy, CT. Um, then I switched to point of care ultrasound and then functional aspects by MRI and MRI especially for lung imaging. And uh, I closed my lecture by giving you some ideas about artificial intelligence. Um, I hope your expectations are more or less fulfilled and I'm happy to answer questions. And thank you very much for attention. And this are a reading list. You have it, these are all frees. I checked it yesterday. You, you can uh, copy to your, what else? Mobile, what else? Uh, this is the overview. Times are changing, a very good overview. This is about chest radiography. This is about lung ultrasound. This is about CT and this is about MRI. And finally, there are links to additional materials uh, very interesting about lines and tubes and neonites, uh, critical care ultrasound. Uh, there are a lot more uh, videos I have shown here if you go on a nest of education. Thank you very much once again for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Meinhardt, for your presentation. I think that uh, it's a really a very difficult task to speak in 45 minutes about uh, imaging uh, in respiratory disease in children, but you did uh, really a very good job uh, and uh, you clearly show which are the indication, the contraindication and the utility of uh, imaging in uh, children with respiratory disease. Now, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, questions and we have uh, uh, only 10 minutes. So I think that we can go on with the question and uh, the, uh, the, those that we were not able to answer, you please remember to answer through the uh, chat. So we can start with the first one. Uh, I will put two questions together because are uh, was done by the same uh, attendees. The first one, what are FOBs? And the second one from the same uh, uh, attendee is how does radiation differ in normal dose CT in thorax in relation to high resolution CT thorax? Oh, okay, this is, yeah. It's the first one and the one that was uh, the fourth question. So the first one is what uh, are uh, I have to scroll down now. I, I got it. <laughs> Field of use. We had it. Good morning. Uh, so the first question I, is what I, are I see here. And uh, I will ask you the question. You don't need to, to read the, the, the okay. question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There is no difference. In the earlier time when I started my training um, uh, more than 20 years ago, there was a difference. Uh, high resolution thorax was a special examination, special slices with skips between uh, some centimeters, uh, apical parts, middle parts. And now the resolution of the, of the scanner since 10 years is so high that you reconstruct from the, from the primary data high resolution uh, slices. You don't have to, to perform extra slices to get high resolution, no. In the primary data, you, your normal resolution is below one millimeter, and that's high resolution. No extra scans. It's so, inside your 3D data volume, and you reconstruct some special slices, 2D slices. So from the same attendees, how does radiation differ in normal dose CT thorax in, of, this, of the chest in relation to high resolution CT? No, no, no difference because it's the same data sets. It's a C, 3D data sets and recon, you reconstruct 2D data high resolution sets. Then we have another uh, question, it's a quite long one, it's more than one, so three questions together. How many ribs do you count to say that there is hyperinflation? How does it differ with age? Can you do high resolution CT with contrast? Uh, our teachers say you either orders this or that because contrast affect in the high resolution. Yeah, the first question is a good one. A lot of literature, a lot of papers. I would say more than eight intercostal spaces. If you have the, the ninth ribs, the ninth ribs, 
if you see it, the posterior parts of the ninth rib, then it's hyperinflated. But I would start with the eighth intercostal space. That's most of the papers cite this as sign of hyperinflation. And how this the next one with age? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say uh, the the older the child, the more ribs you have to count to say it's hyperinflated, yes or no. It's difficult. The younger the child, maybe you have no deep uh, inspiration. Then I, I I look more on the aspect of the lung parenchyma. Is it hypertransparent? I don't count the ribs, especially in young adults. It's the overall impression, I would say. And the, the last question from the same person is, uh, can you do high resolution CT with contrast? Yes, you can do that, but um, you can do everything almost in, in techniques, but it's not clever because if you give contrast agent, then it's bright and they, then you might miss changes which are also bright, hyper dense, we call it, um, in lung parenchyma because your whistles are so bright. If you look high resolution, then you are interested normally in lung parenchyma. And then you don't give contrast agents. It contradicts. Okay. There is another question that I really do not understand very well. What is the CT potentially called? How do you request it? Uh, yeah, I saw it. Potential called. I, I do not know what, what's meant. Maybe okay, sorry. Uh, he writes it once again. And, 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 to, to rewrite the question because uh, it's yeah. difficult to understand the question, yeah. how it's written in this way. So then we move uh, to uh, Gerard. How does knowledge of the location of the hyperinflation in asthma guide treatment? Yeah, it, it's uh, the location. It, it's a good question. The, the location in itself doesn't guide uh, treatment, but it's the, the, the size, uh, the area which is hyperinflated. Yeah, that, that's good. a good question because when I made the presentation, I said the site is important. No, it's, it's the, the, the area. The area, okay. So uh, another question is, what is the difference between non-contrast CT and high resolution CT? Yeah, I would say uh, today, uh, due to the uh, high resolution of the primary data sets, uh, there is no difference. In earlier time, there was really a difference. If you perform the non-contrast CT, then it has a low resolution. And uh, you ha had to be very um, careful for your requests for a CT. When you were, were typing your requests, uh, do you need a non-contrast CT or a high-resolution CT? Nowadays, with the modern scanners, it's not a problem. You can perform, we had this previously, a non-contrast CT with inclusion of high resolution. Okay, so uh, another question is, uh, what is uh, the achievable slice thickness in pediatric CT scan? Yeah, we, we do the reconstruction twofold. We have one millimeter slices for every child. And we also perform slicker, thicker slice reconstructions with 10 millimeters maximum intensity projections, these so-called MIPS, maximum intensity projections, because they give a very good overview. You have, for example, 10 images, and then you have an idea about the complete lung. But we have also this one millimeter slices in the pack screen. Everybody can look on these small slices. And when to use multi-detector CT scan? Every time, because uh, uh, the more slices you have, the higher is the resolution. Very important for children. Okay. I will uh, uh, skip uh, a couple of questions on CT so that we can speak also on MRI. And uh, there's a question, what information do you get from a lung MRI? that you couldn't get from CT? Um, information, with the only information which is better, it's function, ventilation. You don't have an idea about ventilation normally in CT. There are some possibilities using dual energy scanners and xenon, for example, noble gases, but uh, there's also some uh, scientific reports. But I think the functional, the regional functional aspect um, plus no irradiation, that's the major advantage of MRI. Okay, another uh, uh, question on MRI. 
can MRI substitute with the CT with contrast in lung embolia? Yes and no. For example, we use sometimes MRI for pregnant women because no irradiation. And then we can, we are quite sure about central lung emboli, but we don't see peripheral lung emboli. But we say in this special case, uh, very radiosensitive, the fetus, okay, we use MRI, but we don't use this, for example, in, in, in adolescence, then we use CT with low dose, multi-slice low dose. And here there is another question uh, comparing uh, uh, MRI with CT. It is possible to use MRI lung instead of a CT to detect bronchiectasis? Once again, yes and no. The larger bronchiectasis you see, you saw it on the one slide, this was this bronchiectasis in the right lower lobe. The large one you won't miss. You have an idea of what's going on inside lung parenchyma, one, two millimeters you won't see. Maybe with the new techniques as I showed for the fungal infection, you see now, we have now the resolution one millimeters, but this, this is on, on university centers only. Okay. Very expensive three Tesla machines. Uh, there is another question on the uh, follow-up uh, with the MRI. It, it is possible to use MRI lung, uh, of the lung instead uh, for the follow-up of lung malformation that uh, undergone to corrective surgery? Yes. And we use it also prior to surgery. We have over, we had a long discussion with our surgeons, um, which said, oh, I have to, to use the CT because for, for lung information and for the perfusion and for the vessels. But now MRI and MR and angiography is so good that we have a clear cut information about the vessels um, and the lung parenchyma. Maybe we add a low dose CT one, once upon a time but in the follow-up, only MRI. So the last two questions on ultrasounds. How useful is ultrasound in follow-up of atelectasis? Absolutely useful. Uh, and uh, we had some discussions. Um, for example, okay, it's, if it's a peripheral atelectasis, you can monitor it by ultrasound. You see it because you have no normal lung parenchyma, which might reflect all the ultrasound beam. Uh, but also for the central atelectasis, if I don't see any, any atelectasis, it's gone. Yeah, that's very good. And there is another one uh, on ultrasounds uh, that was, uh, 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 where it is? It, is, uh, was, it was, uh, let me see, because I, I, I miss it. The question was, uh, uh, it was more, uh, ah, is more useful uh, uh, MRI or uh, ultrasound in your opinion in the diagnosis of lung cyst and lung abscess? It depends where, where the abscess is situated. If it's, I would say here in this case, where when it's peripheral, then it's not a problem. Then I would take uh, ultrasound because there are very ill children. You can use it bedside, you can monitor it at the, at the ward. Uh, if it's centrally, uh, situated, then you can use MRI. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, please remember to answer with the chat to the other question that we, we couldn't uh, uh, do because of uh, time. So I think that now we have 10 minutes of break and we'll see uh, us again at 10 past 10. Thank you very much. See you later.